Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today on wind farm road design. My name is Erin, I am the resident sort of webinar host here at Softry. With me today is David Mills, he will be tackling the lion's share of our presentation uh, where we're going to get into a road design workflow that you can use for quick planning and analysis of wind farm roads. So, um, well, I've been working on getting something prepared and here's what it looks like in the location module and and here's what it looks like in the terrain, at least one of my output files. But let's go right back to the beginning. So I'm going to start our terrain module. This is where we build surfaces. It's also where you can do uh, some volume calculations and grading. But mostly today we're going to focus um, volume calculations on the location module, the road design module. But we don't know where to put our roads unless we have some wind farm uh, turbine locations. Now we can open all different kinds of files. There are people out there who would survey and analyze winds and come up with a bunch of coordinates where they think that turbines are best located on the ground. And we need to get those number, those uh, coordinates into our software. And there's all different kinds of ways to read them in. We can use Google Earth. We can use DWG. Um, I'm going to use uh, just a simple CSV file, comma, separated variables, X, Y, Z. Um, I've even got one in there in shape format, too. If, if you want, you could bring them in in that format, of course, a GIS format. So, um, Right, I'm going to bring in a CSV file. There it is. And we've got some options to, to um, play around with here, but I've got it all set up already. The important part of this file is that it's just a uh, comma separated file with XYZ coordinates. And you can see it's reading it correctly here. So I'll just bring it in. So there are my turbine locations. They're, they're just sitting on my computer, I have no idea where this is, but we have some great tools for finding things. Um, before you can do anything with uh, Google Earth and finding uh, images, you do need to have a, a coordinate system. And today I'll be working in UTM uh, Zone 9. So once I've got some features, and I've got a coordinate system, I can use our um, life maps tool to find out where the heck it is. And as you can see, this is a real wind farm. It's on Northern Vancouver Island, and uh, it's, it's already created. So it, it gave me a, a lot of ideas about <laughs> how I would design this. Um, so imagery is available. I have some Im images already on my hard drive, but that, that tool can really speed things up for you. I want to bring in my LiDAR data. I have a whole bunch of LiDAR data. It's um, roughly 3 million points or a, a bit more. But before I bring it in, I want to create an area of interest. So I'm just going to create a new feature here. I'll call it AOI for area of interest. And it doesn't need to be a 3D feature. I'll just draw it with the mouse. So in, in uh, Softree's uh, tools, the drawing process is a two-step process. Click once to create a point, click again to anchor it down. And really, um, it doesn't really matter where this goes, but just to give you an idea. So there's a polygon. And I have data that extends beyond that polygon, but I don't really need it. So I'm going to exclude it when I bring in my data. Now I want to insert some files. I can do it from the Insert button or File menu. And these are going to be my LiDAR data. So I have them in the uh, ASCII format, but LiDAR often comes in LAS. And it also often comes in USGS. DEM. It doesn't matter what format you're using, the next steps I'm showing you are applicable. So I'm going to bring in my um, XYZ LiDAR and I'm going to bring in more than one tile. 
I don't even need to know which ones are applicable. I just select them all. And before I bring in my data, um, I'll use this selection option here to choose my area of interest. It's a polygon. It's already in the file. That's important. And that will filter data according to my choice. I could, I could filter the data outside. Uh, that would re remove all but um, 1 in 20. So it would decimate the data. Well, that's true decimation, all but 1 tenth. Actually, I guess you're only supposed to take 1 in 10. Anyway, um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do instead is just skip everything outside. So inside my polygon, I bring in all my points. Nothing is skipped. Outside my polygon, I'll uh, read no points. It takes a little bit of time. OK, so there's all my data. And it started off at 2.7 million. I did that thinning operation, reduced it down. I've cropped it already. And uh, we're well, well inside the range where terrain module and location module are happy, which is less than 10 million points. OK, now um, let's open that document uh, after it's finished, which is this one. One of the, uh, the nice new features in version 10 is the ability to turn on these 3D um, symbols. Yeah, so when you select a, a feature inside terrain, you can operate on it by changing symbols and line types of colors. And new in version 10 is this uh, 3D option. So I've chosen wind turbine here. I could make them look like cedar trees too. That'd be a, a little different. If we go back to the surface file, you'll see that I've, I've put in a background surface. Notice that the roads don't exist on this surface. I had this image from some time ago uh, before they actually, well, I guess before Google Earth caught up. We've generated contours. So I, I just use this function here to generate my contours and to uh, to build my surface. So so now I'm, I'm ready. I've got the terrain that represents the original ground. I've got the turbines. And I've actually got some imagery so I can, I can see what's going on. Now let's jump to the location module where we would do road design. We need a surface. That's the one that we just created. This one here. We also need um, optionally an alignment. Now if somebody has gone to the trouble of creating an alignment for you, you could um, you could bring that in. Land XML formats are available. I actually have some alignments in here, which I could bring in. And uh, maybe I'll do that. I can just delete them or ignore them. And, and uh, yeah, so you can bring in alignments from XML files. That's uh, something that might be exported from another software package, like Civil 3D. And you can choose to import just the horizontal or horizontal and vertical. And you can do one alignment at a time here, but it's pretty quick to add a new alignment afterwards. So I'm just going to bring in alignment number two. You can choose to add a template or not. Depends what you're bringing in. In this case, we do want a template. And here's my alignment number two sitting on top of my terrain. Well, that's not enough for me. Um, also, the, the, uh, the template assigned doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's quickly change that. I think I want to use my resource low volume template. The template table that I'm seeing here is uh, configurable. It's stored in the um, settings and layouts folder. And um, yeah, you can, you can uh, the, all these templates come from a table that's, that's set up as my default. Um, I think I forgot to put my wind farm template inside my defaults, but it's really easy to add. So I'll, I'll show you that process too. Okay, so there's a little road um, made with somebody else's alignment. 
and that might be all you need to start. But I want to show you how to add your own road. But let's add some background so we know where we're going. So I'll put in my pads. Uh, pardon me, my turbines. And I'll also add in my air photo. Images are opaque, so they need to go at the top of the list. Uh, this is the draw order, so it's kind of upside down. Uh, you want the things that are behind at the top and things that are in the foreground at the bottom. There's my um, existing road. Here's some turbines off in the distance, and I need to draw. I need to design a road to get there. Okay, so I'm going to start from basically from scratch here and just create a new alignment. So the um, the alignment, you can add alignments here. You can make a whole network, and I'm going to add a new horizontal alignment. Um, if I choose from file, it allows me to pick a um, an existing alignment in our own format, DSN or DSNX, I can duplicate or I can just create a brand new one. If I choose to create a brand new file, I have that option to pick from land XML again. This is the same option I had before. So I could, I could bring in that other land XML alignment, but I'm just going to, um, I'm going to work from, from scratch here. And yeah, I'm probably going to get the wrong template again because the default is set up wrong. That's okay. Let's quickly switch the template over to the wind farm template. Templates are modifiable. I can, for example, change all the properties of the of the templates in here. And they come in little tables and you can merge in tables from different sources. So here's here's a table that I have on my hard drive that I created just for wind farm um, designs. And WFP wind farm pad is the one I want. I'm going to in, in add that to my list. And it doesn't look all that different, really. They're very similar templates. Um, but you'll see that this is quite different when we add um, some large offsets to design pads. OK, so yeah, you need to get your, your desired template set up. And we need to start aligning. I'm going to start the road from here. And I can just start drawing my alignment. But I'm not getting all the feedback I need. So I'm going to set up my screen to show, um, well, this is what I call the pegging format. Screen layouts allow you to very quickly change modes. And I've created one here called pegging, which just rearranges the windows. So there's my vertical alignment. You can see the ground. You can see the average grade between points. So if I go over here, I'm going down at 3%. If I head over to that uh, turbine there, I'm going up at 0.6%. And I can just try and connect up all my dots. Now, um, this is fine, a 2.3% grade, but as you can see on the profile window, there's a hill in the middle there. Um, so let's add another point, and you can see now that it's 6 and then minus 2. Um, that's all within reason. I, I don't see a big need to, to change the alignment, but if I wanted to smooth that out, I could try and essentially follow the contours. So that's the... the um, Editing the alignment is easy, just a click and then a second click. Um, but now we can see we're going steeply down a hill. And with those contours there, that kind of makes sense. So I need to go at some angle to get a uh, less steep grade. And maybe it makes sense to start on the other side of this turbine. That reduces the grade even further. And whoops. And there's. Eight, minus 8.6. If I'm trying to stay within 10% uh, maximum minimum grade, maybe that's a reasonable path. 
And then I can say, okay, well, let's go over to this wind turbine here. That's pretty well flat. Is it flat in between? No, it's, it's actually a little bit bumpy, but it doesn't look too bad. So I think that's a reasonable path. And then I'll go over to this one here. And now, oops, there's the, there's the uh, gully that I'm crossing. So probably we need to do something different here. Maybe go around the gully like so. It apparently isn't so deep over here. Uh, and then we can go back to that. Okay, so um, I'm getting I'm getting going. I haven't really created a road, but I wanted to illustrate that it there's a lot of tools for for making it easy to create your road. Let me just go back to my normal screen layout. Designing the horizontal alignment takes a bit of time. We do have some tools for horizontal optimization. Um, I would suggest that they're good for possibly refining a horizontal alignment, but you need your engineering smarts to really pick a road through virgin territory and connect up your control point with any um, with a reasonable kind of grade that that you know you can design or or build. So um, I'm going to skip over the next part, which would be to refine that alignment and design the the vertical. I'm just going to open a design that I have um, already. Now this is a network of roads. There's actually four roads in this model. You can see that um, here's the, the designed road that accesses the first few pads. Uh, the pads aren't all that visible. Let me just brighten those up a little bit. The background files, uh, not the pads, sorry. It's the turbines. Uh, there will be a pad for each turbine, but I just want to see the turbines more clearly right now. There we go. Okay, now you can see clearly where the where the turbines are. And in this first alignment, it's actually alignment number one. I haven't accommodated this wind turbine here but I did do something about this wind turbine. And what I did was I created another alignment. It's called pad boundary or pad bound. And I drew it out like that. And then I went into the options for this alignment, which is the, the one that's adjacent to the turbine. And I added a reference feature. There's lots of place, lots of different places you can add reference features. The, the most natural one probably is inside the alignment options. Um, so trains and surfaces are shared, but the reference features are private to each alignment. So uh, this is alignment number one we're, we're working with. And I've created a reference feature here, which is actually referencing that other alignment. So this is a list of all my alignments in, and also some surfaces or terrains. They're not necessarily surfaces. And I, I've chosen pad boundary as my reference feature. And that once I've created that reference feature, then I can go into my templates. Each of these templates has a component which can be tied to a feature. So there's my reference feature. You can add more if you want, but there it is. I could add another one. Um, and the reference feature will pull it out whenever I get near a, um, well, let's just look at it. So that's how I did it. I made a reference feature and here, the template is just the same width as it normally is. But over here, it detects the reference feature out there and it extends itself to fit. Yeah, it looks like I'm still in using the resource um, template. Let's add a different one. This template is very similar in that it it also extends out to the reference feature. 
just like the other one, except that the uh, the volume of the capping layer is in a different category. So here we've got um, SRF1, surface one above subgrade. So that's one material on the road. And here I can hover, I can see it's fill SRF4. So that's another material. So now if I, um, if I want, I can report volumes for these capping materials independently in my final report. Okay, well, that's, that's one way of creating a, um, a pad. I just extend the road to the right uh, or left. I can do it both ways. Now I'm gonna switch over to alignment number three, which is this one here, and use a, a slightly different method. It's essentially the same idea, except that um, my pad boundaries are in a terrain. So, Again, my, um, my template goes out to the edge and you can see that the, um, the template itself is set up on the left-hand side, offset to tie to reference feature number two. But in this case, reference feature number two is defined differently. So there's reference feature number one, there's number two, and if we look in the definition here, we can see that instead of referring to an alignment, it refers to a terrain, in this case, the pad terrain. And that terrain is um, external. It's, about, it's a referenced terrain. And uh, I can modify it in the terrain module. So in the first situation where I was using an alignment, I can modify that alignment right here. I can, I can change it and everything will update. In the second situation where I'm using a terrain feature, I have to actually leave the location module to, uh, to modify it. But let's, let's just uh, go back to alignment number, well, I'm just gonna go to the pad boundary. Um, notice what this looks like now. Looks like that. And if I modify the pad boundary a little bit, let's just put a little kink in it like so, and then update this one as well. You see that it's it's changed its shape. So that's, that's one way of, of working with it. We can dynamically change the pad edge and get an, get an updated, um, alignment. This is one way to, to offset. The other way is to work in the terrain module. And let me just open my pads document. Now this is a, a very long um, pad. The, we had a, a customer who was building a wind farm where it was necessary to have not only a pad for the turbine, but also a lay down area for uh, building the tower. I think they, I think they built the tower in, um, by assembling pieces in the laydown zone. And it had to be close enough. I couldn't have one laydown zone and then drag the completed tower. It had to be close to the, the tower location. So every pad has a, um, a flat area under the tower and then a laydown zone that is also flat, but not necessarily at the same grade. Um, so I, I made these little features. You can create features just by drawing them, but one of the tools that can really help with this is the um, coordinates tool. Now, this comes up by default in XYZ coordinates and typing in XYZ coordinates is not very intuitive, but there's a survey mode, which allows you to, to type in azimuths and distances. And so it's quite easy to build any, any old shape. And in fact, I use this to to flip these around so that I had all the different orientations that were possible. And then once you've created a shape that, that seems reasonable, uh, do I have any right-hand turbines around here? I don't think so. Um, well, I got one out here, but unfortunately it's off the edge of my model. But yeah, if I wanted to put a, um, a pad there, I could just say, well, that one's gonna fit. Um, duplicate, control D, there's also a function in the toolbar for that. 
and drag it over there and then zoom in and um, I'm in move size mode so a click and drag with the four headed arrow just moves but if I move to the edge I see a rotate function and I could probably get it lined up pretty quickly by eye. Um, there we go. So I've added the, I've added that feature there. Now, like I said, that's fallen off the edge of my model. I can't use it. Um, but these ones are pretty much lined up. And now let's go back to the location module and take advantage of those paths. So in alignment number three, um, essentially I did the same thing as before. I used a template that has um, a tied reference feature. In this case, the reference feature is a terrain feature, and I can easily add and remove those. And, and uh, in fact, if I go back there and save this, Location is going to notice that I've modified it and prompts me to reread it. And there is the new pad. But there's the boundary for my, my surface, so I can't go over there. <laughs> I have to stop here. Okay, um, now there's one, one little thing that comes up. We are building a bunch of cross sections here. I'm the, the, um, uh, Cross-section spacing is determined here. You will always get cross-sections at your design points, but if you want to insert some more auto interval points is a good way to go. So I got, I got points every 10 meters plus a few more. Um, but I look at this and I can see the edge of my road over here. It's not following my uh, pad boundary very well. And I'm just going to fix that by adding some reporting points. So it's going to add another cross section wherever I click. And if I click here, you can see that, that now it's more closely following. Same over here. I'll add a new uh, reporting point. It's stuck on the alignment. So I can move my mouse back here and say, yeah, that looks like a good spot. And now it's, it's more or less following. Same over here. Um, so that will improve my volumes a little bit if I add some extra points in areas where I need them, like here. Okay, now I did all that and I, I actually did some optimization on this. And that's where you really get the power of the, uh, of the software. So I've designed this. If I go into the vertical alignment, it's not really clear how I should lay this out to get the cheapest road, but I can tell you one thing. Um, currently, the alignment is all curvy here, and my pads need to be flat, especially the laydown area. So designing this would take a little bit of effort, and getting it to be not only um, workable with all the flat sections for the pads, but also optimal in, in terms of balancing earthwork would take a long time. But I can do that automatically with our um, optimizing software. So that's the next thing I want to, uh, to look at. Oh, I do have a couple of questions. Let me just quickly read here. We had a question about whether you can do the pad separately. Yeah, now I've taken the, in, the, in this example, um, I'm, I'm doing the pads integral to the road for the main reason that it, it will allow me to balance the earthwork automatically with the optimizer. But there's nothing to stop you from designing the pad separately in our terrain module um, and then just importing it as a merged surface and design your road after that. Uh, perfectly reasonable way to do it. And I have an example. Uh, Hopefully I can I can bring it up later if there's some time, but yeah, building the pads as part of the road is a is only one approach. Let's now go on to do the optimization. So I'm going to open this alignment here. Sorry, this is a um, Matt likes to call these cooking show uh, demos where everything's prepared beforehand, so you don't have to wait for the the actual oven time. 
you're saving I'm saving you some uh, time watching stuff, but unfortunately you're you're going to miss a few details. So I want to I want to um, optimize this alignment, and the way to do that is to um, Okay, there's the design. Here's the here's the alignment with no optimization. It looks like this, and it's a vertical alignment, so we can't even see it right now. But there there it is. So I haven't. This is the alignment that I created before I put in any pads. It's more or less balanced. It's not a it's not a bad alignment. Um, but now I want to optimize it with my pads in there. So he, here's the process. I go into the options for the road and first of all decide where i'm going to do my calculations this is pretty short so i'm going to use every single point that will include those reporting points that i created um standard editable reporting points so that will will add cross sections near the corners and uh this is probably not necessary but it doesn't hurt either uh, i'll just take it out Now here we have some choices. I'm going to use curves. I could do straight line segments. It doesn't make a huge difference, but I, I think curves looks a little nicer. And I'm going to let any old curve go in there. So no minimum curve length. And oh, sorry. I want I want simple simple curves. No tangents. Um, you need to decide, define the maximum minimum grade and also the curvature. This is important for long vehicles. How um, how curve how <laughs> what is the maximum k value or minimum k value that you can get your your long vehicle across without uh, high centering on the crest or dragging the tail on the on the sag. Um, so those those numbers are important. And if I just do this optimization now, it's going to come up with something pretty similar to my hand design here. I need to put in the controls for the, um, the pad. And we do that right here. So I have a pad that starts at station 2230. I checked this earlier and wrote it down. Um, and what's special about it? Well, it's the laydown area, so it has to be linear. And I probably want to give it a smaller grade too. And I need an end station here. It's it's going to do that for about 140 meters. It's a long, it's a long, it's a big tower. It's a long laydown area. Uh, did I get that right? Yeah. Uh, and I can add that. Oh, there we go. I had that uh, set to zero and that check on. Right. So add that. There we go. And now the place where the tower goes has to be even uh, flatter. And the uh, it's also linear, and I need the right station range. So it takes a little while. Oops, 2340, I think is what we want there. It takes a little while to get, no, 2430. Yeah. It takes a while to get these all set up, and they're adjustable later if you find it doesn't work quite right for you. Um, so let me just open a design where I've, I've finished with all this work and I'll show you the results. You can also put in control points. Um, I haven't got any here yet. Um, you can add pits. Now this can, this can be used to store and retrieve volume from other roads. Currently, we don't optimize networks, but we're working on it. And this is the cost that, that the optimizer is trying to minimize, your earthwork cost. You cut, cut volumes and fill volumes by cubic meter, and also haul distances uh, times volumes to give you a cost for hauling. So the optimizer is trying to minimize your cost, 
these are the unit costs. And uh, yeah, now let's just reopen the design where this is all done. So in this one, I've already finished all those options and it looks like this. I've got two lay down areas at 5% and I've got two pads at 2% and I've got a little break in the middle so that they can bend. Otherwise there would be no difference between them if, or if, it was, if I didn't leave room for a hinge. Um, let's look at the results of that, and there it is. You can see that the um, there's the laydown area at two percent. In this case, the um, the pad is also at two percent, but on the end here we've got a pad at zero percent, and the laydown area is at two percent. So there's your there's your hinge. Now, to accommodate those long flat pads, I had to to put in a lot of earthwork. And you can see it here in the mass hall diagram. Um, clearly there's cut here and fill there. And you can see it in the 3D view as well. So here it is, you can see there's a, whoops. Uh, there's quite a big fill coming down the hill here. Um, there's my, my lay down area and flat bit. Um, yeah. So to visualize all this in the 3D window, um, I had to add a couple of um, uh, final surfaces. So any alignment that you've created, you can create a, a what's called a corridor surface. And a corridor surface is the surface created by an alignment. So I don't think I've got any alignment twos in here yet. So I can put two in there. Uh, I can give it a color and I can choose what surface I'm displaying. Any one of the surfaces, subgrade, layer above subgrade, or final merge surface, that's just the combination of everything. Once you've added a merge surface to the list of, of available terrains and surfaces, then you can choose uh, how to display it and so on. So there's the color I chose, and it's it's going to display the triangles and the features. Um, maybe I don't want the features. Let's turn that off for alignment three. I'm going to turn the features off. And yeah, why don't I do that for all of those? Can I do multiple select here? Oh yeah, can. Okay. So now those cross section features are missing. It's just the surface. And the one I just added is actually over here. Uh, there it is. That's the surface I just added. One of the tricks in the 3D display is to make sure that the, oops, uh, is to make sure that the original ground surface is partially transparent. And that's this plus button here. Um, alpha channel is your transparency. 255 is opaque. And 100 is a reasonable transparency that allows me to uh, to see through the original ground. Oops. So where the original ground is covering the new road, where there's cut, you see the grayness over top there. Where the road is coming above the original ground, it's just the color of the road. And that's what's also happening over here. So there's the, the pad I created with the um, pad I created with the alignment, and here are the two pads I created with the terrain features in the background. We're just about done. The last thing I want to show you is um, the well, two things. It's possible to create multiple alignments, both horizontal and vertical. So in this particular design, I've got three possible alignments for my um, final road, alignment number three, the end road. So there they are, one, two, and three. And you can also compare them. So in this one, let's just select it as current.
I set the maximum grade to 10%. So you can see here that the grade coming down here is 10%. This is my um, lay down area at 3% and then 2% there. So I said, well, that's expensive. It's costing me uh, $284,000 if my unit costs are reasonable. And wh what if I change the parameters? So that's what I did for number three. And I changed the slope parameters. So you can see here, we've got a steeper slope. And I did that with, uh, again, in the standards, I, I changed the, the maximum slope to 15%. I said the lay down area could be steeper too, but it wasn't able to do that. Couldn't fit it in with all the other constraints like curvatures and so on. Um, but just to give you an idea of how long that process took, uh, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll do the vertical optimization. So I'm recalculating this vertical optimization. At this point, it's, it's calculating all the, uh, all the possible cross sections that will exist. Um, one of the options we set at start was how far above and below ground are we allowed to go? It was set to 10 meters. So it has to sample plus and minus 10 meters from the ground surface and calculate all those cross sections. And then the optimizer can freely choose any alignment in between and calculate a cost. And, and it, it uses um, linear programming to minimize that cost. Using average end area for calculating volumes so it's not perfect, but it's, it's a great approximation and it gives you a result in this case, in about 30 seconds, we're using our um, CPLEX solver, which if you if you have our optimal license, uh, you have to pay extra for the CPLEX solver, and the uh, the optimal license is required for these these calculations. Okay, so there it it generated those 15% grades coming down the hill um, and at the top of the hill, um, and there's my flat pad. Now, how does this compare? Well, the cost is less. Um, what does it look like compared to alignment number two? We have this great comparison option. Uh, yes. And you can see the compared alignment behind. It's blue and it's, it's not as steep. Um, and that's other than that, it's pretty much the same. They're both balanced, uh, but the cost is is higher for alignment two because of the lower grades. That's typical. You know, the optimal cost here is 251,000, 284 if we have gentler grades. And there's you can tweak all the parameters, but probably the biggest gain we could we could make for this alignment would be to move the road around a bit um, so we didn't have to have such a big fill going through this gully. And that would be a whole iteration on the on the design project. Okay, so um, now I've got a design. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I want to look at some volumes. Well, here's a data table that shows the volumes. And notice that the SRF4 and SRF1, those are my uh, road, well, pad capping and road capping, respectively. And then... Um, subgrade cut and fill. This could be divided into different types of material if you went to the trouble of putting in um, subhorizons in the ground. Is it rock? Is it gravel? Is it a layer of, of gravel over rock? You can do that. Um, there's your totals. Notice that it's virtually balanced here. That's because the optimizer had no pits to draw from. from. Um, but if it did, this, this probably would not be balanced. You'd see some pit volumes, which are um, optionally displayed in this dialogue, or pardon me, in this uh, table as well. And here's a typical output um, using our multiplot. So we've got um, page one is is showing plan over profile, or pardon me, the plan profile chapter is showing plan over profile, some um, center line and ground elevations, uh, volumes. This is very configurable and it's very automatic. 
the cross sections are all displayed down here and there's some with the widening in them. We can export this to, um, obviously we can print it. You can export to PDF if you have a PDF writer and one comes with Windows 10, so that should be easy. Um, and you can even save this into a CAD format. And in version 10, we allow you to do that all in one, one big drawing where all the pages get plunked in there side by side. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you, which is kind of related to output, but not really. Um, if I take all the, the, uh, the edges of this, like this point here, which is actually called RE, I think, yep. Uh, and this point way over here, if I export those points, I can make a, um, a surface that represents this. So I took the trouble to export those lines and put them into a file. So these, this polygon that's highlighted right now in magenta is the edge of the design surface. There's the center line. And I took that edge and I graded it using our, our uh, grading tool. And the result is a surface that kind of looks like this. And you can see if you if you look at the well, there's the there's the obvious one. There's a slope going down off the end here, which is more accurate and a little more realistic than what you get in location module, which just stops at the end. So if you want to take it one step further, if it's necessary, or maybe even just for visualization, you can do that. And that leads me to my final um, terrain where. I took the original ground and I did a merge operation with this surface we're looking at now and cut a hole out of the, out of the, uh, the original ground surface and stuck that new surface in there. And there's a, a, a visualization of what, it, what it's gonna look like in, in 3D. One, one of the things in the, of course, is <laughs> you notice it doesn't look so, um, it, there's a lot of fill there, but it doesn't look as um, crazy as it does in the location module uh, because in the in the location design, we always distort the profile by a factor of 10. Um, anyway, yeah, so that's, that's kind of a nice final output. Good. I'm sorry I've gone a little over time, uh, but now I'm going to answer some questions. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thank you, David. You went you threw a, a tremendous amount of detail and coverage. So that video will definitely be useful for folks. Um, if those of you here in the live version, you will get an email with that link sent to you following the webinar. Uh, we do have some additional questions. The next question here, and I believe we've answered a few of these, is about uh, the process for building pads for the wind turbines can be applied to modeling a road with approaches along it. So basically looking at the workflow and whether there is a better way to model approaches along a road in a non-wind farm situation. Yes. Um, so approaches meaning, um, I'm thinking merge lanes for, for highways and so on. You can certainly do that, um, especially if they're at the same elevation. There's no, uh, well, they can't be well, when they start to merge. Yeah, you can do uh, widenings in any road using the same approach. And either the alignment approach or the terrain feature approach, both of those will work. There's another way to do it, which I didn't discuss at all, um, which is called uh, template overrides. And when you're, when you're in the alignment, uh, when you're editing the alignment in the location module, there's an option here to override any parameter. Um, and in fact, I could have built my pads this way too. And I, I didn't even mention that. But um, yeah, like the width, for example, of the road is here. I can override the, the value for the width by station and make my road follow a, um, a particular shape given different offsets. And we did just have a clarification from that particular question asker. Uh, they meant uh, driveways when they said approaches. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, 
you, you can't go too far because the driveway is another linear feature. Um, another thing that I didn't really cover in this example is the um, the intersection of roads, like here, for example. Uh, this the, we've got some double counting going on right at this point here because uh, road number one is is cutting and filling, and road number two is also cutting and filling, and um, you could imagine this as a, as a driveway and often you would have a return coming back the other way too. So you can turn both ways onto your main road. Um, and there are, there are um, the simplest approach to accommodating a driveway is just to widen the road a little bit and then stop. But if you wanna actually design the driveway and merge the two together, there's, there's techniques for that too, where you would widen the driveway to, to give your, um, yeah, in a city you'd call them curb returns. In a driveway, it's just uh, the curvature to allow you to turn in and out. Um, and there's ways to also make the the alignments. Um, yeah, you do it in here in the when you add a corridor surface, you have the option to make it merge into the topo. So, uh, so you don't get double counting. Um, yeah, so we're working on the intersection problem. Uh, there are quite a few workarounds now. It would take me a while to go into all the details, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, yeah, these techniques apply to, to all kinds of different roads. Excellent. Um, and perhaps we'll make this one the last question of the webinar, and we're, we've gone over time, so we'll, we'll wrap it up. But uh, this one's kind of tying into the optimization piece. Um, are you able to optimize the roads together, uh, balancing the earthworks across multiple roads within the project? Yes and no. First of all, um, it's, it's possible to um, move material from one road to another using our optimization software and you do that using um, well we call them uh, uh, source and sinks or borrow yeah stockpile sorry that's a way better term much less mathematical uh, so we do that using stockpiles and in the um, yeah there's pits here there's that you can get pits all over the place but you can add a pit at any station you want and um, to make it into a stockpile, you turn off the variable and you set the volume and it will, it will generate this volume for you and leave it where you said it should be left uh, in terms of stationing on the existing road. And then on the other road, you would, you would choose a borrow pit, same idea, same volume and it's moving the material back and forth. The problem with this approach is it's not automatic. You kind of have to do the optimization in, um, a little bit to, to try it out and find out where the volume should be moving. We are working on network optimization, which will do exactly that. We've got multiple roads and volumes can move between them to balance earthworks. So the, the best um, approach in the current software is to make your roads um, relatively long. You don't want them too long. And, and you're really not gonna move material um, from one end of a, a long road to the other end. So it, it does, they don't have to be that long, but long enough so that um, it doesn't really matter if you move material between roads. You're, you can balance each road ind individually. Um, and in this case, I've probably done it. This is probably long enough that we're not gonna wanna move material across. Um, this road is part of that road, but if I had made it its own little road, then maybe it would, it would be useful to move material from one road to another. Excellent. Well, thank you again, David, for tackling today's presentation. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you're welcome to send them off to our support team. You can reach them at support.team at softtree.com. Otherwise, we hope you come back, enjoy another webinar with us in the future, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.